Uh, well, it is indeed a great pleasure to be here this evening and uh, I've heard about this conference for so many years and I'm glad to be a part of it. But let us pray and ask God to help us. Our Lord and Father, open our eyes that we might behold wondrous things from your word. Please soften our hearts that we might receive that word. Transform our wills that we might be people who do it. Loosen our tongues that we might proclaim your word. And we ask this for the glory of your Son, your living word, in whose name we pray. Amen. Uh, well, friends, I wonder if you could, uh, how, we, how you would define what it means to be human. Rene Descartes, one of the most famous and influential philosophers of the last 500 years, said this, reason is the noblest thing we can have because it makes us in a certain manner equal to God and exempts us from being his subjects. In his view, you see, the thing that makes humans grand is our possession of reason. And so for the last 500 years or so, many scientists, philosophers, uh, have said that the things that make humans exceptional was our possession of reason. We are exceptional because we have consciousness, language, and morality. So Pascal can say of humans that they are but a reed, the most feeble thing in nature, but a thinking reed. For others, being human is all about the sense of responsibility that we all have. Or it is the ability that humans have to change themselves and to shape their environment. For others, to be human is to love. Or the ability to be free. For some, it is just simply our DNA. While for others, what makes us humans is our ability to be creative. Or our ability to be self-reflective. Uh, of course, some are much more cynical than that. Uh, for example, Sophocles calls humans, but breath and shadow, nothing more. Or Mark Twain says that humans are the poorest, clumsiest excuse of all the creatures that inhabit the earth. He has to be coddled and housed and swathed and bandaged and upholstered to make him able to live at all. And he is a rickety sort of thing. Anything, anyway, you take him. Uh, sort of a regular British Museum of infirmities and inferiorities. That is very harsh, isn't it? Sisters and brothers, I wonder what it is that you think. Uh, what is the essence of being human? What defines a human being? Now, I've started talking this way uh, about humans for a reason. You see, I think that God has a view on what it means to be human. And I need to tell you that it has some differences from everything, almost everything above. I think it has some differences on how I, uh, from what I hear Christians say often. So we need to listen to God and how God views humans. So I want to highlight one particular and striking perspective on humanity that God himself makes in his word. He makes it when he creates creatures. He makes it when he creates humans. Uh, in other words, this, I think, is the foundational view of God on humans. It is a statement that shapes the view of humans throughout Scripture. The statement is made on day six of creation in Genesis 1. So please turn in your Bibles to page one of your Bibles and look at verse 26 of Genesis 1. For there, God declares his intention for humans. Scripture says that God says... Let us make man in our image, after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the heavens, and over the livestock, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. He created him, male and female, he created them. And God blessed them. And God said to them, be fruitful, and multiply, and fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over every living thing that moves on the earth. You see, God's description of what it means to be human here is special. It is distinctive. It stands out as being distinctive. I wonder if you can see what it is here. What are humans like according to these verses? Well, firstly, they are male and female. No surprises there. However, what purpose did God have for them together as male and female? Can you see it? 
Well, he did want them to multiply, that is, uh, increase their number. We know that because he says, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. But that's not all. Even being fruitful and multiplying and filling the earth has another word attached to it. Humans, male and fem female, are to multiply and fill the earth and what? And subdue it. The word subdue needs on, leads on to another concept, and that concept is rule. This is distinctive in the Bible. This is what it means to be in the image of God. It is to rule over the, earth, the world under his rule. Now, because this could be misunderstood, I need to explain it. You see, friends, God is a king. He is a ruler. He rules over his creation. He rules with justice. He rules with righteousness, with abundant grace and mercy. Listen to David exulting in this in his very final book in the book of Psalms. It's as though it's the very last thing he wants to say about God. In Psalm 145, David says of God, the kingly ruler, these things. Your kingdom is an everlasting kingdom and your dominion endures throughout all generations. The Lord is faithful in all his words and kind in all his works. The Lord upholds those who are falling and he raises up those who are bowed down. The eyes of all look to you and you give them their food in due season. You open your hand and satisfy the desire of every living thing. The Lord is righteous in all his ways and kind in all his works. So when God creates humans, he creates them like him. He creates them to be rulers of the world even as he is. And he expects that their rule will be like his rule. In other words, they will rule in his image. They will rule over the world just as he rules over the world. That is, they will rule under his rule they will rule with faithfulness, like he does, with kindness, with justice, with generosity. And if I'm right about Genesis 1, if I'm right in this interpretation, then you'd expect to see this elsewhere in the Bible, wouldn't you? And you do. Flip over to the middle of your Bibles. I want you to have a look at Psalm 8. Easy to find, book of Psalms right in the middle of the Bible and you can find 8. You see, Psalms 8, Psalm 8 is a sort of um, commentary on Genesis 1, 26 and following. So have a look at it with me. Psalm 8, look at what it says. I want you to look particularly at verses 3 to 8. David the king reflects upon God and he says these words. When I look at the heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have set in place, what is man that you are mindful of him? And the son of man that you care for him. You have made him a little lower than the heavenly beings. You have crowned him with glory and honor. You have given him dominion over the works of your hands. And you have put all things under his feet. Remember that notion of rule? All sheep and oxen. All the beasts of the field. The birds of the heavens. The fish of the sea. Whatever passes along the paths of the seas. Friends, this is what God thinks of humans, they are his workmanship. But he creates them with something special, something that stands out. And that specialness is that God has crowned them. He has crowned them with glory and honor. He has made them rulers over his world, rulers over the work of his hands. He has put everything under their kingly rule. That is what makes humans special to God in God's world. They are his representatives, living under his rule, exercising his rule over his world. So there's the Bible's picture of humans. Now, I want to stop for a moment and consider if this matches what you know about humans. Are humans like this? Do humans seek to live under the rule of God? Do, do humans seek to rule over the world with faithfulness and kindness and justice and generosity? Do they live like dependent beings as God made them to live? Do they live like humans responsible before God? Now let me tell you that the clear abiding witness of scripture is that no, they do not. We can see shortly after those words in Genesis 1 that God gives, where God gives uh, humans this good word about this good place. 
but they disobey him. Within three pages, they turn the world of, it, of harmony into a world of disharmony, where they're out of relationship with God, their maker, out of relationship with each other, out of relationship with the environment into which he has placed them. And the rest of the Bible reiterates and builds on that notion of what has happened. The end result is that the first humans do what all of us do. All humans are the ancestors of those first ones. All do evil. They do not live as God wants. And they don't rule over this world in the way that God wants them to. So we look at God's word and we see God's world and we see the truth. We do not see humans being truly human. We do not see them living as God intended them to. Now for that reason, uh, sorry, uh, now that we've done that, we've done that long, reason, that long uh, explanation for a reason you see. You see, I've done this because it sits at the back as the subtext to Hebrews chapter 2. Now you may not recognise that, but I hope by the end you will. So please turn with me now to the book of Hebrews because now I think we'll be able to understand what it means. Let's explore it together, having done that background work. Now as we do, let me tell you how I'm going to proceed. You see, this is a difficult and complex passage, critical within the whole of the book of Hebrews. So I'm going to take a run through it with you, but before I do, I need to warn you. I'm going to work you hard tonight. Uh, it won't be that long, but it will be hard. So, uh, but I promise you, it'll have great rewards. So stick with me, there will be great rewards in this for us. So let's get started, and let's get started by remembering the context of this book. We saw yesterday that the book of Hebrews has a memorable and striking beginning. It begins by reminding us that God is a speaking God. He has spoken through his prophets at many times and in many ways. Um, and he reminds us that in these days, he has spoken to us by his exalted son. This son is the heir of all things. He is the one through whom the whole world was created. He is the radiance of God's glory, the exact imprint of his nature, the one who upholds the universe by his word of power, the one who made purification for sins and then sat down at the right hand of God. This one is superior to any angel. And to clinch that assertion, he cites many verses as we saw yesterday from the Old Testament. However, his climactic one comes in chapter 1, verse 13. Have a look at it. Citing Psalm 110, he says, And to which of the angels has he ever said, Sit at my right hand, and I will make your enemies a footstool for your feet. Then after a brief exhortation of his readers in verses 1 to 4 of chapter 2, he resumes his argument in our passage for today. Now I think, I think that he expects his readers to have Psalm 110 still ringing in their ears, reverberating around in their brains as he speaks on. And he says this, uh, chapter, chapter 2. And to which of the angels, sorry, um, yeah, chapter, chapter 1, verse 13. And to which of the angels has he ever said, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for my feet? But then, all of a sudden, his tone changes. And the focus shifts from the exalted son and shifts back to a humiliated man. Look at verse 4 of chapter 2. The angels of verse 13 appear again and our writer says, for it was not to angels that God subjected the world to come of which we are speaking. Then he springs off into Psalm 8. Psalm 8 is critical here for a number of reasons. You see, first as we've seen, it's a psalm about human beings. That is a sort of commentary on it, Genesis 1, 26 to 28. Second, Psalm 8 talks about humans having received rule from God, just as Genesis does. Third, it puts the term man in parallel to the term son of man. And it says, what is man that you are mindful of him and the son of man that you care for him? 
And now when Hebrew poetry puts things in parallel like that, it, it is sort of indicating that the two are equivalent or close to each other, man and son of man. Hence man is another way of saying son of man. Now the fourth reason why this psalm is important because, is because key passages in the Old Testament draw from this psalm. Can you think of some that do? Just off the top of your head, let me tell you one. One example is Daniel chapter 7. Do you remember it? It has the language of one like a son of man coming on the clouds of heaven before the ancient of days to receive an everlasting kingdom. The final reason for Psalm 8 being here, being important, is that Jesus used the term son of man as his favoured way of referring of himself. So when you lump all of that together, and you see Psalm 8, Eight being cited here by the right of Hebrews, you think there's something going on here that I need to listen to. Having said that, I want to now flip past the citation in Hebrews 2 and look at what our writer does with Psalm 8. Look at the middle of Psalm 8, of verse 8, would you, in Hebrews 2. Our writer has just cited Psalm 8 and he notes that in putting everything under subjection to him, that is the Son of Man in Psalm 8, that, sorry, that he has put in everything in subjection, but now look at the end of verse 8. Our writer notes that the word everything in Psalm 8 means exactly that. That is, when God has put everything in subjection to the Son of Man, to man, he's left nothing outside of the control of the man of Psalm 8. Then he goes on to say that at present we do not yet see everything in subjection to him. Now, a number of commentators think that what is going on here is that the writer of Hebrews has started referring to Jesus. In other words, the hymn in the second half of verse 8 is Jesus. We don't yet see everything in subjection to Jesus. I don't think that's right. You see, I think he's referring to man, the son of man of Psalm 8. I think he's saying that what Psalm 8 looks for, that is, the whole of earth being subject to humans is what we do not yet see. Psalm 8, you see, looks for a human who has everything in subjection to him. And that is not what we see. Friends, Adam was given rule over all creation. He failed to exercise that rule properly. He did not live as God's king under God's kingly rule. He did not rule in the way that God rules. He stepped out from under God's rule. He made himself the ruler. And every human since him has followed. Even the kings of Israel followed after him. However, Daniel 7 promised that a human was coming who would not rule as other humans had. He would be worth giving rule to. And God would do exactly that. When he found such a human being, he would give him that rule. He would give all rule and authority to him in fulfilment of Psalm 8 and Genesis 1. For there would be a human who had everything in subjection to him. Can you see what the second half of verse 8 is saying? It is saying this. It is saying to the readers of Psalm 8 that we do not yet see its fulfilment. The fulfilment of Psalm 8. We don't see the fulfilment of Psalm 8 realised in all its benefits. But then comes verse 9. And the, and the writer tells us what we do see. Can you see it there? Look at verse 9. He tells us that we see a particular human being. A particular human being who for a little while was made lower than the angels. Then finally, for the first time in this epistle, that human being is named. Our author simply says, namely, Jesus namely Jesus. Jesus, who up until this point has been known in Hebrews as the exalted son, but not here. No, here, he is simply Jesus, the human. Jesus, the human, crowned with the glory and honour prophesied in Psalm 8. Finally fulfilling Psalm 8. Finally fulfilling what Adam was meant to do but did not. But how and why? What had this human being done that might cause him to be crowned with glory and honour? Well, verse 9 tells us, 
He, Jesus, is crowned with glory and honor because of what? Because of the suffering of death. That is, this human being, this Jesus died. He faced the suffering of death so that others might not have to. In other words, he acted as a true human being should. He ruled as God is said to rule in places like Psalm 145. He ruled with grace and mercy. He raised up those who were bowed down. He was righteous in all his ways and kind in all his works. He heard the cry of humans and he saved them. And the second half of verse 9 says that by the grace of God, such a king as this died for all humanity. By the grace of God, he tasted death for everyone. Now look at verse 10. Our author moves beyond Psalm 8 now. In verse 9, he mentioned God the Father and his grace. This God is Father. This God the Father is the creator. He is the one for whom and by whom all things exist. And look at what he says. He reflects back on the suffering that he mentioned of Jesus in the previous verse. And he observes that it was fitting that this creator God, this one for whom and by whom all things exist, in bringing many sons to glory, should make the founder of their salvation perfect through suffering. Friends, it is supremely fitting to make the founder of our salvation perfect through suffering. You see, unlike all other human beings before him, he was obedient to death, even death on a cross. So obedient to God the Father that he was willing to die. He lived under God's rule. He exercised God's rule. He followed God's rule. And as this author will say later in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 7, he came to do God's will. And this will of God was what? Salvation. In verse 9, as verse 9 indicates, it was to bring many sons to the glory for which God created them. You see, back in Genesis 1, God created humans for a glorious destiny, not for something else. No, it was human sin that spoiled that destiny. As Psalm Psalm 8 said, God created humans to be crowned with glory and honour. Thus, this was spoiled by human disobedience. However, now, in and through this human Jesus, the glory has returned. Through the incarnate Jesus, the sons here receive the glory that was not earned by them, but won for them by the suffering and obedience of the true human in Psalm 8, or of Psalm 8. Now let's move to verse 11 in Hebrews 2. Have a look at it. Our writer tells us that the human Jesus who sanctifies and those who are sanctified are of the same stock. That is, this Jesus and us share a common origin. We have one source. He is the unique son of God, so they are the sons of God in an extended sense. That is why, you see, he's not ashamed to call them brothers and sisters. In verse 12, our writer now gives three more scriptural citations. The first comes from a psalm that nearly every early Christian would have recognised was about the suffering of Jesus and his subsequent exaltation. Do you know what it is? Psalm 22. And you know about Psalm 22 that Psalm 22 begins with the cry that Jesus cried in his agony on the cross. Do you remember what he said? My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? That's Psalm 22. However, in the original Psalm, when the Psalmist had passed through suffering and is vindicated, and he leaves lament behind, Lament leaves his voice in the second half of Psalm 22. He turns to praise and thanksgiving. And do you know what he says? He says these words. I will tell of your name to my brothers. In the midst of the congregation, I will sing your praise. Friends, isn't this beautiful and overwhelming and deep and profound? For here here in Hebrews 2, we are looking over the shoulder of a man steeped in Scripture. And he knows that the first citation in verse 12 comes from Psalm 22. He knows 
that Jesus has cried in the opening words of Psalm 22 in deep agony and dereliction. And he knows that later in that psalm, the psalmist turns to his brothers and sisters and praises the God who vindicated him. And now he says to his readers, know that this psalm finds its fulfilment only in Jesus who suffered. And what's more, it finds its fulfilment also in them. You see, this human Jesus who was made perfect through his sufferings turns to them, or if you like, turns to us. And he calls us kin, his brothers, his sisters. The eternal son of God made human. He put his trust in God. He endured the suffering of death. And God bound him together with the gift of children. Verse 13. And that is us. Is this not magnificent? You see, this picture is really filling out now, isn't it, as to what has happened. Look at verse 14. That which is not fully explained earlier is now spelt out, you see. Since the children of God had, that God had given him were human, it was necessary for the son to assume humanity. Through his death in obedience to God, he is victorious over the great adversary who had the power over death, that is, over the devil. Through death, he destroyed the one who has the power of death, that is, the devil. Can you hear this? It could only be through the exalted son becoming the humiliated Jesus and dying that God might bring into existence a new humanity. Us. A family of glorified children, verse 10. A family of sanctified children, verse 11. A family of children liberated from lifelong slavery, verse 15. A family of children purified from sins, verse 16. Friends, no angel can do that. The Hebrews may be exalting in angels in chapter 1, but here is someone who puts angels in the shade. Here is the exalted son of man. No angel can do this. Only a human can do this. Only the exalted but humiliated son can do this. Only a human who does what humans have not done till this point could do this. Only a human who becomes a merciful and faithful high priest in the service of God and makes propitiation for what humans did, did can do this. Now our writer is going to spend many chapters spelling out exactly how Jesus did this high priestly work. However, here he's laid the groundwork for what is to come. He has prepared the patch. But do you notice the crunch in verse 18? Have a look. If this is our high priest, then he's the ultimate source of our help, isn't he? If, if, if our high priest will not stop at humbling himself by becoming human, if he will not stop at perfecting us through his own suffering, if he himself has felt our nature and knows our temptations, then he is able to help us. Friends, let me tell you, when I first prepared this passage, I spent a week doing it. It was uh, about a year or so ago. Uh, I was preparing to explain it to others, and I struggled with it. And I became captivated by it. And, uh, you know, as I got deeper and deeper into it, I caught myself unexpectedly on the edge of tears a number of times. This view of Jesus is extraordinary. It's majestic. It's exalted. It's eternal. This, the image of the invisible God the begotten son of the father, the beneficiary of the throne of God, the one who, of, to whom God says, sit at my right hand and I'll make your enemies a footstool for your feet. That's not all. A human being as well. A true human being. Submitted to his father unlike any other human in history. Humbled, are taking the same nature as me and you, willingly humiliated, embracing the suffering of death, true man for true man, 
true person for true person, deliverer, and then the one who turns and calls me brother, who sings my praises in the midst of his people, who is unashamed of me and of you, and who delivers me and you from the fear of death. A human alongside me, my great high priest. Friends, this is my Lord. And if you have accepted him and all that he has done for you, then this too is your Lord. This is the extent to which he has gone for you. Is there anywhere you will not go for him? Is there anything you will not do for him? If you are clinging to something other than him and being restrained in your service of him, let me plead with you to turn back. Fix your eyes on this portrait of him. Look deeply at it. Soak it in. And then do what our author suggests in chapter 12. Lay aside, let us lay aside every weight which encumbers us and the sin that clings so closely to us. Look to this one, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is now seated at the right hand of God. Consider him, and do not grow weary and faint-hearted. However, I don't want to finish there. I want to finish where our author has finished back in chapter 2. You see, I'm aware that there are people here today who are struggling. People weary, perhaps faint-hearted, discouraged, or maybe tempted. Disobedience. Disobedient may be restrained in our service of our Lord, or perhaps bound to some besetting sin. Friends, I want to remind you of what our reminder, our author reminded us of at the end of our passage in chapter 2. Do you remember? You see... We share in flesh and blood with our Saviour. He likewise partook of the same things. He became human in order to destroy the one who has the power of death over humans, that is the devil. He knows what it is to be human. As verse 17 says in chapter 2, he was made like his brothers in every respect. He is also one who himself has suffered when tempted. Who is able to help help those who are being tempted? Well, who can sympathise with our weakness? He can. Not only this, he is also our high priest who can make atonement for those very things, for our sins. Friends, let me tell you that the Lord Jesus Christ is no distant, remote person. He knows our frame. He knows your frame and mine, for he shared in flesh and blood and even death. And he can sympathise and help and rescue in our weakness. He can make all things new and he can forge a way ahead. He did it for our salvation and he and his father can equip us to do this work and can work in us that which is pleasing in his sight. In and through him we can receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. So run to him. And keep running to him. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for our brother who deigns to call us brothers and sisters. Thank you for our high priest who can make atonement for our sins. Thank you that he shared in flesh and blood and even death and can therefore sympathise and help and rescue. Thank you that he can make things new and forge a way ahead. Thank you that you and he can equip us to do your work and work in us that which is pleasing in your sight. Thank you that as we come to you, we can receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Please, please, Father, cause us to run constantly 
to the Lord Jesus Christ. Father, we pray this in his name. Amen.